First things first, Tartarus ain't actually the mall's name. That's just what I call the place on account of the store I have to guard. I won't tell you the mall's proper name for security reasons, but yeah. So one of the stores in the mall is called Tartarus, and this store is perpetually closed. I've never seen it open. A metal sheet lives across its door and its window displays are always empty. Boarded up, even. The instructions, to put them simply, are as follows. 1. Watch Tartarus. 2. Don't let anyone in. 3. Don't let anyone out. I work the shift from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Monday to Friday. Gets pretty damned boring. Mall closes at 9. Last staff are out by 9.20. And then it's just me. Just myself. A gruff and relatively miserable late middle-aged man all alone in this mall. There's five other men like me. Or hell, some could be women, I guess. Two of them do the weekend, I hear. The other two do weekdays. One works 4 a.m. to 12 noon, and the other from noon to 8 p.m. We're not supposed to meet each other. That being said, I'm pretty sure I bumped into the guy who works the noon to 8 p.m. shift once. He just had this look about him. Twenty or so years younger than myself, I should think. Hard to tell since he was wearing a mask. But he'd seen some shit. You can see it in their eyes. He nodded at me as I passed him by. Seemed to realize he was running late. Could have just been a stranger, I guess. Ex-military or something, but... I don't know. Just had a feeling. I'm working right now, in fact. It's a typically dead and quiet night. The moon is out, and its light shines through the purple, tinted glass of the roof, washing the vast, open plan of the mall in a pleasant, dreamlike violet. I glance over to Tartarus, the metal sheet door sits resolutely in place. The windows are dark and dead. You can hear stuff coming through sometimes. Whispers and mutterings. On some nights, the metal rattles. Those nights ain't fun. I take a sip of my coffee and lean back in my chair. I say, my chair. It's one of the mall's massage chairs. It isn't turned on, but it's still comfy. As I try to relax, the music in one of my headphones starts cutting in and out. I grumble in frustration and pluck the bud from my ear to fiddle with it. Damned things. I need new ones, really, but I wouldn't have the faintest idea what to look for. My daughter got me these... eight years ago, I think it was. They might have been good then, but they ain't much good now. They've held out pretty well this whole time, though. So that's something, I guess. Still, frustrating. I'm listening to Jolene tonight. Or, well, trying to. My employers are secretive people. I was scouted for this position, and you know what? It actually pays pretty well. I've been doing this stint for five years now, and only felt the need to ask for a pay rise once in all that time. And the fuckers gave it to me, no question. I suppose I could ask for another, but I don't want to push my luck. The money is decent. And for what? Watching a damn closed-up store in an empty mall, keep some secrets, and occasionally do what needs to be done. Don't let anyone in. Don't let anyone out. I take a sip of my coffee. Hmm. I think back to my early days, back to when my daughter was still just a young kid. I was far more curious about it all back then. Hell, who wouldn't be? I glance over to the metal door of Tartarus. Towards the end of my very first week, I had already dislodged that thing. It ain't hard, if you've got a bit of strength to you. Raise it up and then unlock the barred door behind, easy enough if you have the key. And then you can just stroll right in. I don't know what kind of a store Tartarus might once have been. I remember looking around. The walls were painted red and black and gray and were peeling. Scuffs and scratch marks streaked the carpets. The place was pretty empty, although not entirely so. There's a dusty old right-angled counter in the middle, and I remember seeing a clear plastic spray bottle half filled atop this counter. No cash register, no items or racks or shelves, just this one bottle, a small rag, and a marker pen right beside it. 
The bottle was labeled Bleach. In the far corners of the store, which by the way, appeared ever so slightly further and wider than one would expect. In these far corners were a collection of eerie mannequins, all faceless, leaned and stacked against each other in various sizes, all faceless, all stripped of clothing. Some of the mannequins had stuff written across their faces. I remember walking up to them, walking past and taking a closer look. Upon the closest was written, Jaden R. Curious. On the next was written, Charlotte R. And then, on the third, a little further along, Zach S. I couldn't make sense of it back then. I remember puzzling over the names. I counted five different initials in total. R, S, N, T, and S, L. There were seven mannequins with names attached to R, four attached to S, two marked with an N, two marked with a T, and only a single mannequin labeled with an S, L. One of these mannequins, a male figure labeled with a Chu T, had been crossed through with a large black X, and five of them were entirely blank. I found a storeroom near the back filled with dozens more. What the fuck is this place? And you know these mannequins weren't even the weirdest thing about the abandoned store. The weirdest thing by far was hidden behind the counter, right in the center of the room. A singular, deep, dark hole, right there in the middle of the floor. God damn, I had murmured aloud peering cautiously down. The hole in the ground reminded me of one of those kids' slides, the types you see in McDonald's fun houses and ball pit play pens. Old and dusty and grimy, hard plastic. It went down about six or seven feet into the darkness and then rounded a gentle corner. And there was something else too, around the hole. Around the tunnel's entrance, there's this general, creeping sense of unease. It's tough to explain. There's this sense that the floor upon which you walk is fragile. Far more fragile than you give it credit for. That everything is more fragile than you give it credit for, in fact. It's a cold and clammy sensation, and gets right under your skin. You can hear the whispering more clearly when around the hole, too, if you stay there long enough. In my early days, I'd stick around that creepy tunnel for ages, despite the unease. The allure of the mystery was too great, almost an hour at a time. I even went down into the tunnel too, despite my caution, poked around, had a good look to see where it led. I quickly stopped doing that. I don't go into Tartarus anymore. Not unless I have to. Not unless I really, really have to go down into that tunnel, but thankfully, such an occasion is rare. I shiver. Don't much feel like talking about that right now. I take another sip of coffee, sighing with frustration as my right earbud cuts out yet again. Damn thing. I take it out to fiddle with it some more, and in doing so, my ear picks up the sound of a pattering in the distance. My senses are primed at once. I reach into my pocket and pause the music. I stand from the chair, set down my coffee, and determine from which direction the noise is coming from. The pattering rises into a murmur, and before long I hear the laughter and muffled speech of what sounds like a group of teenagers. Great. Haven't had to deal with something like this for a while. I check my watch. 1 a.m. I wonder what the cause could be this time. A break-in, perhaps? Or maybe... Just a group of dumbasses who hid away in some store and waited for the mall to close. Maybe they're making some kind of YouTube video. That's what the last group were doing. When was that? August? September? I shake my head with a grumble. Idiots! I mutter, deciding on tonight's approach and folding my arms, waiting for the group to round the corner at the far side of the mall's open plan. Their laughter becomes louder and louder, growing more obnoxious with each step. They round the corner, and my suspicions are confirmed. Five teenagers, all washed in that subtle purple light. I'm standing so still that it takes a second for them to spot me. Once they do, however, their laughter cuts out at once. 
and the pattering ceases as they come to an awkward and sudden stop. I let the moment hang in the air, then I break it with a simple, you kids shouldn't be in here. Get the hell out before I call the police. The one in the front of the procession opens his mouth to say something and glances from me to Tartarus and then back. I narrow my eyes. Interesting, interesting and troubling. I'm really, really hoping these dumb kids aren't here to see Tartarus, though none of them have their phones out. It doesn't look like they're filming any kind of video. What are you doing here? The kid at the front asks. He's got some stubble around his chin and an oversized white sweater. I can sense the general anxiety of the group, but this guy seems bolder than the others. What the hell kind of question is that? I work here. Get out. Don't make me ask you again. You're not wearing any kind of uniform. And what kind of security guard hangs out right in the middle of the mall? Sweater takes a step forwards and again glances from me to Tartarus. Less subtly this time. Dude, no way. Was Rex telling the truth? One of the girls of the group mutters to the boy beside her. She looks between me and the accursed store. You're trespassing, I reiterate, raising my voice. Just go for God's sake. Leave by whatever way you came in and leave me to listen to my crappy music. The group's other girl, one to sweaters left, looks up at me. Why would you want to listen to crappy music, she asks. I push some air out through my nose. Well, gah, it's not the music so much as the headphones. Look, that's really not important. I falter, squinting. Hey, wait, don't I know you? You're one of Abby's friends, right? Abby is my daughter. The girl's eyes widen and she takes a step back. Uh, um, yeah, I know you. Fuck's sake, I'm Abby's father. You're Maddie or Riley, something like that. Avery, she squeaks. Yeah, that's it. Look, I remember you. You're a good kid, I'm sure you all are. So just get out of here. This is your final warning. What about Tartarus? Sweater asks me. I take another step towards the group. What about it? Well, what's in there? Nothing. That's a lie, chimes in one of the others. A boy to Sweater's right, long blonde hair over his fringe. There's stuff in there. We know there is. I take another step towards them. Kids these days so fucking reckless. Back when I was young, if I'd seen someone like me in a place like this, at a time like this, I would have ran for my damn life, not engaged in chit chat. I don't know who you've been talking to, I reply through gritted teeth, but I can assure you that there is nothing of interest to you or to anyone in that empty ass old closed down store. So you won't mind if we take a look around it then, Sweater replies, and he draws from his pocket my key. I am actually taken by surprise. It glints violet in the light. But it's my key, all right. No doubt about it. The long, sharp, and serrated silver key to Tartarus. I can see the store's logo, or symbol, or whatever emblazoned across the handle in black. How the... You dropped in back there in the hallway, Sweater replies. Careless. There is a tense pause. Now... Sweater shouts, and the group disperses. Avery goes with Fringe in a pair, but the others all split up and run their separate ways. For fuck's sake, I bellow out into the mall, taking off after them. My footsteps echo as I walk the length of the mall's central hall, closer to the fountain and the statue upon it. It's not a horse on this side. It's an enormous coiled snake, white marble, lidless staring eyes, and sitting atop it. I jump in shock and swear to myself under my breath. He's often lurking around down here, but he's never in the same place. And he's a frightful fucker too, to put it lightly. Hello, Minos, comes the voice of the figure sat upon the snake's head. Like a hiss, almost. The voice is smooth, yet unsettling. Good evening, Typhon, I reply steadily, composing myself and looking up at him. You're looking handsome tonight. Typhon has tonight chosen the form of myself. 
Sitting up on the top of the snake is a copy of me, though, as with the mall, the copy is twisted. Typhon's copy of me is pure white, and when I say that, I mean everything. The hair, the skin, the clothes, all a mist-like, ghostly white. All except for the eyes. There is no color in the eyes, just void black. Typhon grins and flickers out his tongue, like a snake's. He cocks his head at me. You've made a tragic mistake tonight, haven't you, Minos? Typhon does not know my name. It's safer that way, and I intend to keep it as such. He knows that it begins with a M, however, and he chooses to refer to me as Minos. A mistake, sure. I don't intend for it to be tragic, though. We all make mistakes. Some more than others, Typhon replies, licking his teeth. He does not blink. There is a pause. I had best be looking for them, then, I say, doing my best to sound casual. I imagine you saw where they all went. I did. I saw where they went. And, and I don't suppose you're going to tell me, are you? When did I become so predictable? Typhon replies with a stretched white grin. Mm -hmm. I mutter in response. All right. Well, I'll be seeing you then, Typhon. I start walking around the statue of the snake on its fountain. I watch in my peripheral vision as Typhon creeps like a lizard across the statue's head. Have you thought some more about the offer I made you, Minos? Typhon asks, his voice dropping and the hiss in his throat becoming more prominent. It will save you a great deal of trouble a little further down the line. I doubt that, I reply, looking directly ahead and leaving the statue of the snake behind me. And, as before, my answer is no. Well, the offer stands. I do hope you change your mind. I hear the sound of Typhon scuttling down the marble of the statue. I shoot a quick glance over my shoulder, but he has already vanished. And when I am sure he is gone, I breathe just a little easier. It may not seem like it, but Typhon scares me more than most down here. He was in a good mood tonight. I continue on along my way, aware that the clock is ticking, ears straining for any hint of the group, listening intently for any clattering, speaking, or screaming to accompany that faint orchestral music. I think hard. The kid in the oversized white sweater, the ringleader of this little group. What was it that the duo upstairs had said his name was? Bryce and Bryce's older brother is a guy named Rex, a nighttime alcoholic, by their accounts, and the owner of the key Bryce used to get them all down here. This troubles me greatly. Ignorance is bliss. I know more now than I had wanted to. So Rex is likely one of my mysterious colleagues, another of the shift workers, the tragic guardians of Tartarus. It fits, given the existence of the R initial scrawled across many of the mannequins upstairs. And this colleague of mine has supposedly been careless with his key. Stupid bastard, I mutter, though my heart goes out to him. And now his brother is down here in the depths, maybe with Abby. I increase my pace. If I'd heard stories about this place from an older brother, through drunk ramblings, I guess, where would I want to go first if I was some stupid kid? A couple of potential answers come to mind, and I settle on one, adjusting my course and heading to the right. I pass beneath the silent, watchful gaze of the eerie storefronts on either side. The color schemes, all washed in violet, of course, seem vaguely familiar in one's peripheral vision, but when you turn to look directly at them, well, as I said, they ain't anything recognizable dreamlike and nonsensical. I can hear voices ahead, male and female, kid voices. It's them, all right. I start jogging. I round the next corner. In the mall upstairs, the actual mall, I guess, this right here would be one of the mall's exits. The corridor leads to a large bookstore, and if you walk right through the center, then you leave into one of the parking lots. You can see the exit from the store's entrance, 
Down here, however, beneath Tartarus, the bookstore does not lead to an exit. It only leads into more corridors of the mall. There are no windows. There are glass panes in the walls, sure, but they only give you a view back into the mall, not to the outside. The layout starts getting weirder from here, more labyrinth-like, less Euclidean, if it please you. In the center of the bookstore is another feature that is missing in the one upstairs, a giant, carved titan. It cowers with one hand above its monstrous face, snarled in rage and fear. As with the snake, and I suppose with the horse, it appears to be made of white marble and is so huge that it takes up the bulk of the room's center. Even the escalators do not rise above the top of its head. The teenagers are in here. There are seven of them, as Liam and Avery had suggested there would be. There's Bryce, the oversized white sweater guy. There's the two from the initial group, a boy and a girl, and four new ones. I am relieved to see that Abby is not with them, though, and it appears that Avery may have told me the truth. It does concern me, though, what Bryce might have told Abby about this place, about Tartarus, and whether she would have believed any of it, and if she did, whether she connected any of it to myself. Upon my arrival, they all turned to me at once, high off of the energy of doing something you're not supposed to the feverish excitement of being in some place secretive and strange. None of them have any idea what sort of danger they're in. I can see it in their faces. None except for Bryce, maybe. I come to a stop and we regard each other, them and I. Do they know, kid? I ask him after a beat, careful not to use his name. Do they know the danger that you've put them all in tonight? I look them over. And don't use each other's names, I add. If you call each other by your real names down here, then you might not get back up. There are creatures down here that are always listening. What's he talking about, Bryce? One of the girls asks him, the excitement faltering in her demeanor. For fuck's sake, I bellow, striding forwards. They back up against the base of the statue of the Titan. What did I just say? What the hell is wrong with teenagers? Why are you all so goddamned thoughtless? I jab a finger into the girl's face. I appreciate that she's just a girl and I'm a grown man, and the gesture must come across as quite frightening. But frankly, I don't particularly care. My priority is getting them all out of here. I said no names. No names. Do not use my name, if you happen to know it. Do not use your friends' names or else you might just get stuck down here, forever. I grab Bryce's collar and swing him round, throwing him a little ways towards the bookstore's entrance, back towards the mall corridor, the way we came. You've put your friends in danger tonight, I tell him. Now you can think of a way to apologize to them as we head back to the entrance. Fuck off, old man, Bryce replies, snarling at me. Bryce murmurs the girl behind me in shock. I spin round. If I have to tell you one more goddamn time... Leave her alone, Bryce shouts. We're not going with you. We all knew the risks coming down here, and we're not leaving until we've completed our mission. What the hell are you talking about, kid? I reply, exasperated. Why are you so intent on being down here? Just let me do my job, for Christ's sake. I'm getting real tired of this shit. Why are you so stubborn? This isn't the place for some dumb teenage urban exploring. We're not urban exploring, you miserable old fuck, Bryce replies, folding his arms and fuming. My brother gets sicker every day, he says. I won't say his name, but you know who I mean. He's worked at the mall for so long. So, so long. I don't know why he doesn't just quit already. Contracts last three years, I murmur. He can quit at the end of every three-year period if he wanted to. Then why doesn't he? Bryce replies, yelling. Why does he put himself through it? Again and again and again. And what the hell even is this place? He puts his head in his arms and then throws them out wide. It's all real. It's all real. I thought it was drugs. I thought that my brother might be wasting away in some crack den. 
But the more I researched, the more I stalked and watched. It's all real, Tartarus. He pauses, gathers himself. My friends came down here with me voluntarily. They trust me, because I trust them. There is a murmur of determined agreement from behind me, from the little gathering. Bryce's eyes flash, and if it's all real, then that means Tifon is real, and it's his fault. It's all his fault. The air in the corners of my vision begin to shimmer, slightly. A book on a nearby table stand starts to shake. Kid, I say, carefully and quietly. I walk forwards and try to usher him onwards. It's time to go. He shoves me away, and his friends go to stand by his side, staring back at me, some anxiously, some defiantly. It's Typhon's fault that my brother is stuck in this job. I'm not sure how exactly, but I know it must be his fault, and I know he's evil. So we're going to find him, and we're going to kill him. I cannot help a panicked laugh escaping my throat, which seems to rile Bryce up even further. Kid, what? What are you saying? You think you'd be able to kill Typhon? You think you'd be able to, even if it were possible? This is insane. Unless you want to put your disappearance on your brother's already burdened conscience, then go. Go back to the entrance. All of you. A voice from above cuts through our clamor like ice. It is a disconnected fragment of sentence, chilling in its lack of context. The voice is neither male nor female, raspy and cold, hissing in bouts of fiery spouts. The big one shouts, I know what I will see before even looking up. It's one of Typhon's playthings. We're steadily running out of time here. The eyes of the kids before me go wide with terror as they look up to the ceiling. I crane my neck unenthusiastically. Above us is the plaything in question. It has the rough form of a human, like Typhon, entirely white. Unlike Typhon, however, the thing has no eyes. No features on its head at all, actually. No face, no hair, no ears. Just a blank canvas. It has one large mouth in the center of its chest. The mouth puckers and salivates as it creeps across the ceiling. It moves tentatively, but surely, like a spider. It has no legs, but instead boasts six arms. Two from where you would expect. Two from the joints where its legs should be and two from its hips. It is an abomination, and abominations are a plenty down here. What the fuck is that? The boy to Bryce's right asks. The boy from upstairs, adorned in a blue hoodie. That is our cue to leave, I reply, pushing them towards the entrance. Is this all of you? There's no one else? Just you seven? Most of them are stricken by the monster overhead. But two of them nod at me in response. Game s hisses the creature. I would love a game. Love. Love. A lone flower in the cold field. Its ramblings are lost to a general murmur as I quickly draw the door to the bookstore closed behind us. Bryce gathers himself. He glares at me with a purpose and a determination well beyond his years. I came here for a reason. There are worse things than Typhon down here. My brother talks in his sleep. He mumbles when he's wasted. I know what needs to be done. I'm not afraid. And the kid pushes right past me. He slams open the bookstore door and races right through to the doors on the opposite side. Blue Hoodie goes with him. One of the new girls goes as well. I've got your back, man. The boy shouts as he joins his comrade. We're with you, the girl cries. You idiots, you'll never see the daylight again. I roar after them, painfully conscious of Typhon's plaything scuttling across the shelves above and after them. I swivel back to the rest of the group, my chest tightens. Fine. They want to disappear so badly then, so be it. Fuck them. Anyone else want to die down here in the dark? I am met with stricken silence. Good, then let's go. I grab two of them and start to run back through the mall, but I let them go after a few seconds. They are all running with me this time, 
back through the corridors, back past the statue of the snake. I glance up, but Typhon himself has vanished. He could be anywhere now. We stumble towards the entrance to Gaia. In you go, I pant, grimacing as I catch my breath and stretch out one of my legs, back through the tunnel. One of the girls turns to me. She's from the original group that I saw upstairs. Curly black hair. But what about Bra? She stops herself. What about the others? We can't just leave them. I clench my jaw. They made their choice. I ain't their babysitter. She grabs me by the sleeve. Please, sir, please. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry we made you come down here, and I'm sorry we all thought this was a good idea. But you can't just leave them. I look at the faces of the kids before me, hesitating. He'll never give up, says one of the boys. Never. If you don't go after him, then he's going to die. Please, we're sorry. I blow some air through my nose. I ain't giving you my key, I tell them. And if I go up to unlock the Tartarus door for you, then by the time I get back down here, it'll be too late. If I go after them, then who knows what'll happen. There's no telling when I'll be back. You might have to wait for the next person on shift to come and let you out. That's not so bad, one of the boys replies bravely. Bravely or foolishly. How long would that be? I glance at my watch. Two and a half hours or so. Well, that's not so bad. Perhaps not, but I pause. But what? The girl with curly hair replies. But whoever comes to let you out will be bound to the rules. Just like myself. One, watch Tartarus. Two, don't let anyone in. Three, don't let anyone out. But there's no telling whether or not they'd actually let you out. I finish simply. We're not supposed to let anyone out. And the longer you stay in Tartarus in the realm below, the worse it gets. There is a long silence, and the kids look at each other. An unspoken agreement passes between them. Guys? Curly asks, and the others nod. She turns back to me. Please, we can wait. Just go after them. I consider their request and then swear quietly. For fuck's sake. I point to the tunnel. Head up anyway. I don't want you creeping around down here. Head up to Tartarus and wait for me there. I start jogging away again, back through the mall. I turn to look over my shoulder and I jab a finger at them. Hurry! And don't touch the damned mannequins! And as they scurry back to the tunnel, I let out a heavy sigh and carry onwards. Onwards through the purplish light of the world below, for better or for worse. God help me. Racing through the mall, I again reach the bookstore, the store that marks the edge of this branch of the complex. I put a hand on the glass pane of the window and look through, peering this way and that for any sign of Typhon's abomination. Where are you, you bastard? I mutter as I cautiously push through, taking the key from my pocket and brandishing it like a weapon. The door squeaks as I step inside and it closes behind me. Step by step, I walk the length of the room, round the statue of the agonized titan and between the still and silent escalators. Nothing. Though this is not necessarily a good sign, it likely followed on after the trio. Already across the room, I push through the next set of doors and out into the corridor beyond. To my left and right are more stores, endless, bleary, and unidentifiable stores. I look down to my watch, and a sharp chord is played in the distant orchestra. Hmm. I wonder if perhaps I'm wasting my time. These kids have brought this fate upon themselves, after all. I notice a trash can knocked to the ground. There's no trash inside it, of course, but a decent indicator of where they might have gone, nonetheless. I take the corridor beyond it, to the left. The pattern on the floor here is covered in subtle, false shadows. It gives the impression that it rises and falls in unusual places, making it difficult to move in a straight line. I think about Rex, about the young man I saw that one time while starting my shift, about the look in his eyes. My fellow guardian, Bryce is his brother. He might be a little shit, but Rex is a watcher of Tartarus, dammit. A gatekeeper, 
like myself, and I'm just not one to leave people behind if I can help it. The stores here stand at weird angles. A bench beside me is longer and thinner at one end than it is at the other. It looks normal when viewed from a certain angle, but from any other it is strange and disturbing. The way ahead branches into three paths, and I come to a stop, catching my breath. Which way did they go? As I consider the options, a clear drop of liquid falls in front of my face, splatting quietly against the ground by my feet. I look up, and above me is an abomination, perched against the ceiling and staring right at me. I mean, it has no eyes, so it's technically not staring at me, but it might as well be. It certainly feels like it is. Its body is angled towards mine, and a low hiss reverberates out from its enormous mouth. Quietly, slowly, I edge away. You know where they went, don't you? I murmur. Don't get distracted by me now. You just keep going, and I'll follow. Follow the yellow brick road. Bricks us and stones may shake my bones. I don't want to go to the theater tomorrow. It rambles in a low, wet voice. It licks its teeth and creeps just a little bit closer to me. No, I warn, heart pounding, reaching into my pocket to grasp the key to Tartarus. Keep going on your way. Which way to the train station? He tells me we are running out of time. It creeps closer. This one is interested, it would seem. These things can be tricked, though. There is a formula which has varied results. The nonsense they spout. They react to the things around them, but sometimes they provide glimpses into their former lives. You can use this against them. The theater. I begin, standing my ground. There's no room on the upper deck. We have to go to the lower floor. Lower. Lower the flag. The parade will end soon. The abomination whispers as the sweat down my back starts to chill. Still, it creeps closer. Saliva drips to the ground with another wet splat. Lower, I repeat. Lower levels. The end. There are lower levels than this. Lower levels. Lower. The lower levels are worse. There are worse levels below. The lower levels are worse. There are worse levels below. I brandish the key before me, and it glints violet in the light. The abomination pauses. There are worse levels below, it repeats. We regard each other for a moment more. The lower levels are worse. There are worse levels below. And I could send you there. I finish, and the abomination is done. With a little hiss, our twisted palaver is done, and it turns from me, continuing on along its way, crawling across the ceiling. I check around to see if there are more, and once I am happy, I follow along after it. It'll have Bryce's scent now, if none of the others. I'm careful to keep a comfortable distance, but I feel sure enough to return my key to my pocket. Glancing around warily as the abomination leads me deeper into the labyrinth. Through corridor after corridor, the sound of hissing grows louder. Through passage after passage. And at last, there they are. Around this final corner stood in the middle of a wide intersection of varyingly sized corridors are my trio, Bryce, Blue Hoodie, and the girl. They stand in the shadow of another marble titan statue. The ceiling is higher in this section of mall, and the titan towers up towards it. Its upper chest, head, and shoulders are above the mall's next level. It looks like there are more stores above us, but there is no way to reach them. The Titan's fists are bald in rage, and emotion frozen in time. The abominations are creeping their way around almost every visible surface. There must be at least fifty, or more. Jesus. I murmur. Bryce is hurriedly reading through the pages of a small notebook. Blue Hoodie and Girl are standing on either side of him, sweating and anxious, watching the encroaching abominations. Blue Hoodie spots me first, and he nudges Bryce. The three of them look over to me, and Bryce grimaces, stowing the notebook away in his pocket. 
Why are you still following us? He asks, his voice echoing around the space. I cringe and glance from abomination to abomination. They aren't going to hurt us, Bryce says, though he doesn't sound too convinced. I know what they are, what they used to be. You don't know jack shit, I reply. Now what do I have to say to convince you to come back? There are people who care about you, you know. Not me, particularly, but people. Bryce half smiles and raises his voice. Typhon, he shouts, to a sudden shiver of hissing around the room. I want to make you an offer. I shake my head with gritted teeth as a cool draft blows down the nearest corridor. Hello? Typhon replies. All eyes look up to see him leaning over the rail of the floor above us, peering down with that grin stretched wide across his face. He has taken the form of Bryce, an altered Bryce of course, pure white with those black unblinking eyes. The three kids draw a little closer together. What do we have here? Typhon asks as he drifts down from the rails like smoke, settling on one of the titan's knees and resting there. Two young gentlemen and a young lady. He looks over to me. His gaze is, as always, cold. These fine folks with you, Minos. Tipan, I mutter, raising a hand. Just let these ones go. Typhon laughs, and the abominations, all perched in wait around us, echo the sound with a series of hisses. Let them go. I'm not keeping them. Typhon's attention drifts back to Bryce, and he leans forwards, resting his chin in his hands. His snake-like tongue flickers out from his mouth. You think you have an offer to make me, young man. I know you like to make deals and bargains. Bryce begins, reaching into his pocket, but Typhon interrupts. Oh, do you? Do you now? You must know all sorts of things. How clever. A clever man. His grin stretches wider still, cracking the corners of his mouth. Clever, echo the abominations, hissing. Clever and cleaver, meets to be cleaved, four-leaf cleaver. My blood chills. And what kind of deal and bargain would you like to make with me today? Typhon asks, staring down into Bryce's face. Bryce swallows and draws from his pocket the key to Tartarus, his brother's key glinting purple in the light. What the hell are you doing? I hiss to him, but he ignores me. I will give you this key, Typhon, Bryce says. He is doing his best, but he does not sound as confident as he did before. I'll give you the key to Tartarus, in exchange for something of equal value. And what would that be? Typhon asks, the purple-silver shine of the key reflecting in those black pools of his eyes. Release all the abominations attributed to R. Just let them go. Now that is an interesting request. Typhon replies after a pause, slithering around the titan's knee and standing instead on its foot. A little closer to us, but still a meter or so above ground level. Attributed to R, you say? Well, I don't have the first idea which of my playthings were the responsibility of your brother. You're a liar. Bryce replies, though still trying to keep his composure. Ah, so R is your brother then? Typhon grins, flickering his tongue. I thought I picked up on a family resemblance. Noted. So you stole his key. Are you sure that it's really yours to offer and trade? Bryce falters. Typhon chuckles and speaks on. And I'm not lying to you. It's so difficult to keep track of who sends me my playthings. And why would I care? It matters not who allows them down. I watch this back and forth with white knuckles and a clenched jaw. I do not know if Typhon is truly interested in the key. He's never expressed any particular interest in mine. Though, it's possible Bryce knows something I don't. Bryce grips the key a little tighter, holds it a little higher. Let the abominations go. That's why my brother keeps doing his job year after year. It's because he can't forgive himself. He can't forgive himself for all the people he's let through, and he'll never stop coming here until they're all free. Typhon starts making his way towards Bryce. His steps are slow, 
and lazy, but his eyes remained fixed resolutely on the boy. Do you know what I would do with this key? I would use it as bait. Your brother will come down here to try and retrieve it from me. I don't know how he'll get down without a key, but he's a smart lad. He'll find a way. I doubt his employers would accept such a loss. He grins. If they know that you were able to steal his key in the first place. Well, then the damage might already be done. Bryce lowers his hand a little. He stutters. His... his employers? Ah... Uh, Typhon says, his eyes flashing. So, you don't know everything then? Interesting, so very interesting. He's standing right in front of Bryce now, looking directly into his eyes. Your offer is a fun one, but I don't accept offers made by mortals. Allow me to propose one of my own. Is this Bryce's plan? I wonder. A bargain? And a dangerous one at that. I rack my brains as to how to get them out of this. But the next phase kicks in even as I mull it over. Typhon's attention flickers back to the key. That same violet light shines in the void, and his tongue darts out past his teeth. And in this moment, Bryce suddenly raises his voice. The lower levels are worse, he shouts. There are worse levels below. There is a rumbling of hissing from around the room, but my stomach drops. That's not going to work on Typhon, kid, I shout at him. You have no idea what you're doing. Enough is enough. But Bryce carries on. He holds the key in the manner that one would hold a cross in the face of a vampire. The lower levels are worse. There are worse levels below. Typhon is entranced, fixed on the key. He does not move, and I do not believe what I am seeing. No, no, surely not. This simple trick. It wouldn't work on Typhon. It couldn't. It barely works on the abominations. The lower levels are worse. There are worse levels below, and I will send you there. Bryce finishes, and in this exact moment, the kids to either side of him, the boy and the girl with their eyes downcast and barely moving, extras even, not worth a second look, completely devoid of Typhon attention, jump suddenly into action and two sharp blades. Long knives drawn from inside their clothes are stabbed into Typhon's chest. There is a sudden scream and a blast of icy arctic wind. The abominations and the kids and myself are all knocked backwards as the screech echoes round and round the hall. The elbow of the great marble titan cracks and dust rains down from its joints. Typhon twitches in agony and he collapses like a stone to the ground with a thud and for a moment we are stuck in stunned silence. The abominations are likewise frozen. No one dares move. And then a dark grin spreads out across Bryce's face. He looks to me. You see? He begins quietly, then louder. You see what I told you, old man? It worked. He looks down to Typhon's corpse. The tension now eased, he releases a laugh. You couldn't help yourself, could you? He taunts. That's when you're at your weakest, when being offered something you want. Bryce laughs and hugs his friends, drawing them close. He's giddy with excitement. That was for Rex, he shouts with glee. He turns to the abominations. You are free, but the abominations do not rejoice. The mood cracks. Rex, Typhon whispers with delight. Bryce spins around in alarm to find Typhon standing behind him, hands clasped behind his back. The corpse vanishes in a burst of mist. Bryce panics and stumbles, shoving the key into Typhon's face. Typhon pushes it aside with a sigh, his tongue running quickly over his teeth as if it had a mind of its own. I don't want your key, Typhon hisses. He twitches. I don't need it to lure your brother down. He comes down all the time. And Rex, you say. His name is Rex. Saint, stay back. Bryce splutters, his courage completely shot. The lower levels are worse. There are worse. Typhon laughs in Bryce's face and increases his height. He's still using the boy's form, but it grows. Now, 
stretching upwards like a snake. Rex! Typhon laughs feverishly, drunkenly almost. He looks up to the sky and laughs all the louder. Rex, 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 a noble name. What's in a name, eh, Bryce? He stares suddenly down into the face of the boy, his black eyes shining and terrible. I have begun my retreat. Careful and slow, I beckon to the others, to Blue Hoodie and the girl, and they have begun to creep towards me, but Bryce is trapped, transfixed. This was fun, Typhon says airily, tapping Bryce on the head. But I think we're done now, Bryce. Typhon has begun to salivate grotesquely. Saliva spills from his lips and splashes against the cold floor below. I can't wait to meet him. We have so much to discuss. Typhon's neck slithers around and his eyes meet mine. I made him the same offer I made you, Minos, he whispers. I wonder if he'll be more inclined to agree when his brother lies below, especially now that I know his name. I take a step back as the abominations close in. What have you done, kid? I murmur. What have you done? Typhon giggles with glee, frothing at the mouth, and his twisted form, his pale copy of Bryce, stretches further up above our heads like a monstrous cobra. Rex, 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 he repeats over and over, and he points carelessly down at the quivering Bryce below. I'm done with this one, he says to the waiting, watching crowd with a wave of his hand. Bryce can be taken. Hissing and salivating, the abominations scurry towards him. I leap from my position and close the gap in seconds, grabbing the boy by the collar of his sweater and hauling him out of there, roughly pushing aside the abominations as they cluster around us. They are more cautious of me than they are of Bryce. I knew that much already, but still, there's just too many. I struggle under the growing weight of the creatures, their cold, clammy hands all over my face and body. I feel their hot, wet breath against my skin, their hissing in my ears. I can feel the sting of their teeth as they bite at my arms and legs to keep me in place to keep me in place so as to undergo the process. I can feel one of my hands starting to become numb as their paralyzing saliva begins taking effect. And I can feel them tugging at Bryce, pulling at his joints as he cries out in alarm. There's too many of them. There's just too many. They're wild, unfocused, frenzied and riled up by their master. In fact, I realize a truth about the chaos. They're getting in each other's way. I can probably get myself out of here, but... But to do so, I'll have to let go of the lad. He screams louder. Just let him go and you can escape, Matthew. Fuck. And you know what? I prepare to do just that. I make my decision to abandon him. It's brutal. But tough decisions have to be made down here. I curse and release my grief bitterly ready to leave behind the boy for whom I've already risked so much. And in that moment, two voices cry out loud above the clamor. My name is Emma Ray, calls out the girl just ahead. Jackson, calls out Blue Hoodie, just off to the right. My name is Jackson. And confusion bubbles amidst the ranks of the abominations. The clustered crowd around me thins as their attention is diverted and displaced. Jackson, Typhon repeats from up high. Emma Ray, he grins and dismisses them with a wave of his hand. The mass of abominations split. The ones further back go for their new targets, for the boy or for the girl. I swallow a great breath of air as the pressure against me is reduced. I shove away the gaping, gnawing mouth of an abomination on my arm, drawing blood as I do so, and I briefly turn around, reaching back for Bryce, grabbing him and hauling him out of there as fast as I physically can. Jackson swings round his blade. I catch it flashing in the corner of my eye. Emma Ray does likewise. But they are too far away for me to help them now. There are too many abominations between us. Get back to the corridor! I shout to them. I glance back. 
Bryce has an expression of terror and bewilderment frozen across his face. His eyes are wide. One of his arms is bleeding, and one is fixed in place, hung awkwardly out from one side, paralyzed by the look of it. He limps, and a quick look down makes it clear that he is struggling to flex the muscles in one of his legs. I stop and stumble and hoist him up into a fireman's carry, no easy feat when one of your hands has basically fallen asleep, and begin barreling my way back to the corridor. On me, kids, I shout, already exhausted and now facing the prospect of running all the way back to the main hall with this teenager on my back, but but the kids are in no position to join up with me. I shoulder away one of the screeching abominations, cursing as I feel the teeth from one of their massive mouths crunch into my leg. I stamp right into its throat and it chokes, struggling beneath my boot before it scuttles away. Kids says, hiss one of the nearest creatures. Kids today, gone tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. I mutter quickly in response, backing up and into the corridor, looking to my right and to my left. I watch as the knives of the two brave children go flashing and slashing. I watch as they are gradually lost beneath a sea of the creatures. Tomorrow never comes, I continue, so lower your expectations. Expectations, salutations, lower your expectations, lower your levels, there are levels below. The levels below are worse. There are worse levels below. There are worse levels below. The abomination repeats, slinking back a little, though keeping me within pouncing distance. Guys! Bryce screams, writhing on my back. Guys, come back! But they cannot hear him. The hissing rises. Emma Ray's blade comes up above the tide of abominations for the final time and she is lost beneath the monsters. Fuck, I swear, still retreating, looking over now to the boy in the blue hoodie, to Jackson. I catch flashes of blue amidst the pale skin of the abominations. An abomination steps on the drop blade with one, its cold hands, and it skids across the floor in a way. The creatures have sensed these two kids to be the easier targets and have largely left us alone, for now, and a quick glimpse through the crowd shows us Jackson's fate. His is the fate of everyone who gets taken by the abominations. The teenager is paralyzed, frozen. His legs are in process of being swallowed up whole into one of the abominations mouths. His arm is lost in the gullet of another. Jackson! Bryce screams out struggling but I do not let him go. The abominations fight each other, pushing and grabbing and throttling with their many hands, hissing and screeching until one of them wins the fight, and Jackson is once again lost to view. They will take everything they can. The abominations will absorb all but his most basic core essence. He will be left as warped and distorted as the beings that surround us. It's time to go. I'm sorry, kids, I mutter turning to take my leave. I catch Tifon's eye as I do so. The black eye in the white, now ringed with orange and rivers of yellow, like a hot and burning coal. The stretched and snake-like creature towers over us all. Rex, he mouths, licking his teeth with that serpentine tongue. Then loudly, he speaks. I'll be seeing you again soon, Minos. I'm sure you will, Typhon. I reply sadly, shoving to the side one of the bolder abominations as I flee the scene. No! Bryce shouts, doing his best to kick me with his working leg. You have to go back, please! I'm sorry bud, not this time, I reply grimly as I make my hasty retreat through the distorted mall complex. A couple more corners, a touch further, and yes, there it is. The bookstore, just up ahead. I can see the statue of the Titan through the glass. Bryce has begun to sob. There's no fight left in him now, poor bastard. Nearly there, I grunt, unable to keep myself from slowing at this stage. A bit further. I push us through the double doors of the bookstore with my good hand, 
and they swing quietly closed behind us. For a moment there is no sound but that distant orchestra, and then I nearly jump out of my skin as an abomination creeps round the corner ahead from between the shelves. It could well be the one from earlier. Perhaps it never left the store after all. Fuck, can you walk, kid? Yes, he replies, and I set him down. He stumbles and staggers into the nearest shelf, and a book goes falling to the ground. The abomination cocks its head, hissing with its great wet mouth as it creeps in a wide arc around us. Just get through the door. I'll be right after you. Go on now, I say to Bryce, and to his credit, he does so. He limps, and I make sure to keep myself between the abomination and he. Go on. Go on without me. It'll be okay. The abomination hisses as I back up through the store, still trying to catch my breath. I bump into a table and send another couple of books to the floor. I grab the Tartarus key in my pocket and hold it out in front of me. It's okay, I mutter, beginning the little trick. It's okay up here, but it's harder, lower. The abomination pauses, hard. It'll be hard without you, Darren, it whispers. I hesitate and a slow chill runs up my spine. Why, what did you just say? As I mentioned before, the abominations spout nonsense. They react to the things around them, but sometimes, sometimes they provide glimpses into their former lives. And this too, you can use against them. I can hear Bryce behind me, breathing hard as he watches our interaction. The abomination hisses at me, it approaches. I raise the key. What did you say? Where did you go? Who turns out the lights? Darren, I repeat quietly. Was that your name before? Are you giving me sentences you said yourself? Or are you repeating what someone said to you once before? Perhaps a long time ago? The abomination has stopped mid-creep, body angled towards mine. It does not reply, nor does it repeat or echo my words. Gritting my teeth, I step towards it, sweating. I'm going to go for it. The penalty for screwing up is rough, but it would be good if I could save just one more. The abomination does not scuttle away at my approach, nor does it lurch forward to tear into my hand. It instead sits tensed as I place my palm on the pale, smooth skin of its head. Darren, I mutter, then clearer. Your name is Darren, and I free you now from the clutches of Tartarus. What follows is no pause, no moment to consider. Reacting instantly, the abomination rears up on its hind legs in dry heaves. It makes a strangled, gurgled screech and heaves again, this time with a torrent of saliva that splashes across the thready carpet of the bookstore. I watch, wide-eyed, waiting, taking a step back as the monster writhes, and at last it convulses violently and heaves up an entire person, naked and soaking wet. A man, in his mid-twenties by the looks of it, and all that is left behind is an empty skin, a twitching, pale, and crumped pile of skin, like what a shedding snake might leave behind if a little larger and with more teeth. Blera. I wipe the sweat from my forehead and crouch down, nudging the expelled body. Darren, I ask quietly, and the body stirs. What the fuck? Bryce mutters from behind me. Great. More carrying. Love to carry fuckers around. I grumble to myself as I hoist this disgusting, slippery, naked man up onto my back. Urgh. Bryce does not seem in the mood for humor. Don't really blame him. But he and I walk side by side and back through the mall. Back past the statue of the coiled snake and towards the entrance to Gaia. The man on my back has begun to stir. It doesn't usually take them long. Good, I say, as I set him down with a grunt. He slips and staggers to the ground and I reach out a hand to help him back up. He stares at me, at Bryce, at his surroundings. Don't worry about it, pal. You've been saved, I sniff. You're welcome. You'll get your voice back within the hour. 
Now be a good lad and go through that there tunnel. Darren turns to look through the doorway for Gaia, at the long tunnel that burrows into the peeling green-blue wall at the back. Go through first Bryce, he'll follow, I say, and the boy nods. Hey kid, I say, and he pauses, looks to me. He looks awful, shell-shocked, broken. I'm sorry about your friends. I cap the pen and return it to the countertop, glancing at the bottle of bleach and the rag as I do so. Once Rex sees that this soul has been saved, he'll use these things to wipe the mannequin's face back to blank. I hope this goes a little way towards alleviating your burden, man, I mutter, before clenching and unclenching the fingers of my bad hand, encouraging the blood flow to return. I stride out into the mall. The kids are all teary-eyed. Darren stands awkwardly at the side, wearing ill-fitting clothes and unsure what to do. Darren, I say, do you know where you are? Do you know your way home? The man nods, mumbles something incomprehensible. You know how long you've been down? He hesitates. I can't say for sure, pal, but your name's been on that mannequin since Easter. I remember the displays the mall had set up, so you've been gone for about ten months or more. He stares at me, and I nod to him. Best of luck, pal. I'll be seeing you. And he nods once more, and wanders away. My approach might seem cold, but I've done this before. He'll be alright, don't worry about him. I turn next to the kids. It's time for you guys to be heading home now, too. I say to them, gentler than before. But sir, Curly asks me, stepping forwards. What about Jackson and Emma Ray? You'll, you'll see them again someday. I don't know when. It's rough, I know. And I know that none of you are likely to get much sleep tonight, but you need to be heading home now. I nod to Bryce. And make sure your brother gets that key back. Don't ever tell him you were down here. Curly nods at me reluctantly and she returns to the group. The group of five, and I watch them leave. They catch up to Darren and walk with him, looking after him, perhaps. I wait to see if Bryce is going to say something. He turns back to me on his way out just once, washed with the others in the purple light through the sky windows, but he remains silent. And after they have left my field of vision, I return to Tartarus. I lock up the front door with a click and I slide the key into my pocket. I haul down the metal sheet with a rattle and walk back to my chair, slumping down with a great, slow sigh. I reach down for my coffee and take a sip. It's cold now, of course. Hmm. And so that's that. Lots of open threads, unfortunately. Here at my little story's end. Sorry about that. C'est la vie. But I'm still doing my job here in the mall and trying to do it a little bit better, too. Or am I? Fuck. On the whole, yes. I am more vigilant. I'm far more cautious. Nobody's been let in, and nobody's been let out. That being said, however, I have an occasional guest these days. A guest who comes by sometimes during my shifts. It's Bryce, of course. He comes alone and he sits nearby on another of the massage chairs. I tried to shoo him away the first time, but you know what he's like. He's a stubborn bastard. So I let him sit with me, on the condition that he didn't bother me. He's suffering, the poor guy. And I don't blame him, he's guilt-wracked, nightmares and the like. He's wanting to go back down, you know, back down into Tartarus. I haven't allowed it. Bryce wants me to open the door and to allow him to return to try and save his friends. He feels that it's his responsibility. I take the fact that he is actually asking me as a sign that he's truly returned Rex's key. That Rex is being more careful with it. Or maybe that Bryce has developed some form of begrudging respect for me. Perhaps it's both. But Typhon will be growing impatient by now. I know that Typhon is desperate for Rex to return, to welcome my colleague back to Tartarus, and to throw open his arms and to make the man an offer an offer to beat the one made by our mysterious employers all those years ago. 
I shift in my seat. When Typhon is in a bad mood, he can be very unpleasant. Very damned unpleasant indeed. And I don't know what he would do to Bryce if he thought he could use the boy to lure Rex back down. He was careless before. He was willing to let the abominations consume him. He was arrogant. Thought that Rex would come back down regardless. But Rex has done well. He's held out from his obsession. He's stepped up his game as well, perhaps. I haven't asked Bryce if the guy's still drinking. A part of me doesn't want to know. I suspect that he probably is, to some degree. Though hopefully he's at least cut back. Typhon won't make the same mistake. And so, I cannot allow Bryce back down, as badly as he wants to go. Credit to the kid, he isn't whiny about it. He doesn't pout or beg, he just nods and settles back into his seat, staring bleary-eyed at the door to Tartarus. Sometimes he drifts off. Through the sky window, the clouds roll gently across the moon, and the mall is bathed in shades of gently but ever-changing purple, indigo to violet to lilac and back. The music comes crisp and clear through my headphones. Jolene, again. Bryce had tossed this pair to me one night, still in their box, brand new. They're not from me, he'd said. Avery bought them for you. They're the latest model of the shit ones you're using now. And damn, they sure are nice. They're more comfortable too. Maybe kids aren't so bad. Frustrating, sure. Irritating and anxious and stubborn and emotional. But hell, don't mean they ain't good people at heart. Indigo, to violet, to lilac, and back. The world turns, and Tartarus turns beneath. That's it for today, dear viewers. Be sure to leave a comment letting them know if it kept you up at night. And if you enjoyed this narration, don't forget to subscribe to the Diabolical channel for more terrifying stories read aloud. Thanks for watching, and sleep tight.